Thanks to everybody who's jumping on early. We'll probably let uh, this thing go out until maybe 2.01 or something like that before we really get started. But I've got a few intro things to say before we get to Professor Allen. So we'll probably get started here in just a minute or two. <clears throat> you guys are seeing the slides okay, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Fran. Thanks for letting me know. My goodness, we have a lot of people who are already jumped in. <clears throat> All right, I am going to take this down. My guess is we're going to still have plenty of people who are joining in for the next two or three minutes, um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for our first ever My Favorite Lecture, um, also known today and today only as the Moberly Area Community College Mid-Afternoon Happy Hour. That's the only way that I can think to describe it because we had so many people from Moberly sign up in the last 24 or 48 hours that uh, I have to assume that's a whole bunch of people who are coming in to support their colleague, uh, Professor Becky Allen. So I thought that that was really cool seeing how many people registered just like I said, in the last day or two in support of their colleague. Um, we had 168 people registered for this webinar, Time and Stress Management, which is a record for an MCCA webinar. I'm so happy that everybody joined us. Um, so just some quick background before we throw it over to Professor Allen, um, uh, some background on where the idea came from. Um, we were at the MCCA convention in Branson this past fall, and everybody was getting their awards. The awards winner were coming out, outstanding adjunct, um, excellence in teaching, senior service award winners. And I actually leaned over to Katie at one point, which um, Katie is like right here where our offices are our side to side right here. Um, I actually leaned over to Katie at one point because there were so many amazing things that were being said. When you win an award, your school has submitted an award application, a submission, and they send us, sometimes it's just a few sentences. Sometimes it's like what seems like a novel praising you guys. And so we were reading off excerpts from those submissions and I leaned over to Katie and I just said, this is such an incredible resource that we have here right at our fingertips. And we need to figure out a way to take advantage of that a little bit more. So we start, started brainstorming. We came up with the idea of asking our award winners to give their favorite lecture. And when I say favorite, that's a very subjective word here. We are leaving that up to the faculty and the staff who are giving these lectures. This can be something where it's the lecture where their students have the biggest reaction or the most positive feedback. Um, it can be the one with the most life lessons in it. It can be the one that gives the most tools for tackling your next challenge. Whatever they think is their favorite lecture, we are going to let them give that. Um, so hopefully this is a mixture of something that is entertaining. I think that we have all had that feeling of walking out of a lecture hall and feeling especially inspired or just knowing that what I heard here in the last hour or so is something that's going to stick with me for a very, very long time. Um, so I, I hope it is entertaining in that way, but I also hope that this is something where we can provide some value to um, all MCCA members. And I think that we've got that here with something that is has obviously been a very, very popular topic in the last couple of years, especially since the start of the pandemic with time and stress management with Professor Becky Allen from Moberly Area Community College. So Professor Allen, uh, has been with MACC for 12 years. She was the Governor's Excellence in Governor's Award for Excellence in Teaching winner 
um, this past fall at the MCCA convention. And um, yeah, Professor Allen, we're going to get going. And I'll just say before she gets started that we have been talking for the last month or so, and she was stressing over and over and over again, this lecture is better when we have, when it's interactive. So mm -hmm. I'm going to turn my camera off and my only job for the next however many minutes or for the next hour, however long we go here, is going to be watching the uh, participants list and just <clears> seeing <throat> if anybody raises their hands, asks to go off mute, stuff like that. So if you want to contribute, we want you to contribute. So we're watching for that. And uh, yeah, Professor Allen, take it away. And thank you very much in advance. Oh, you're welcome. And thank you, Mr. Judy and to MCCA for giving us this opportunity to do this. Um, when you when you first mentioned it to me, I thought it was a lot of fun and it's always fun to, to share what we do in the classroom because, you know, by nature, us teachers, our, our students are the only ones who see what we do <laughs> and our, our colleagues don't see anything that we do. So um, I have just some, some opening comments and then I'm gonna go through a PowerPoint and I, I have a couple of other things to show you. And I feel like as I was preparing this, um, I have so much, <laughs> so much stuff. So some things I'm going to kind of gloss over. I've got some articles and just a couple of quick things, um, some stories from my classes, uh, things that we were just talking about this morning. Um, and I, this is just a combination of topics actually kind of all culminated into just this one hour. So I, I, I by nature, I talk kind of fast anyway, but I want to make sure and get through everything. And I've, I've just got lots of comments and um, stories and stuff, but I feel very strongly about this stuff. I feel very strongly about managing our stress, managing our time. I, I feel like those two things are the same. I mean, in a way that if you have time management, I mean, it goes a long way to stress management. We're also gonna throw in a lot of stuff about sleeping, um, getting enough sleep, why it's important, what happens when you don't. Um, so I'm going to kind of start out with the stress part, talk about ways to reduce stress, and then ways to do that are time management and sleeping. Um, so I just wanted to start out with a couple of things. What I do uh, in my classrooms to try to inspire kids, to try to uh, get them to make that transition. I feel like it's very important also just to transition from, I know they're coming in from chemistry or calculus or something and come into my class and it's like, okay, so get to have a small conversation and talk about things, just anything. Um, and then just, you know, transition into our class. Um, I like to do a lot of inspirational quotes. Last year, MC's, uh, MACC was, we were all virtual the whole year. And so this room, actually, I had my picture of Mr. Rogers right here and I quoted him all year. And um, I feel like it's, it's, those are some good ways to, you know, to work on stress, also to have something motivational and stuff. Um, so one thing that I like to talk to students about also about when we're trying to talk about change, trying to change something about us, trying to, for the good, for the better, trying to develop that stress management, the time management, trying to make things better for ourselves. Um, I have a joke and I'm not that funny. And I, I'm just going to throw out the question and then I'll just go ahead and give you the answer. But I, I feel like this is really key. So a lot of you've heard this, but uh, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is just one, but the light bulb's really got to want to change. So the whole thing about today and everything I'm going to talk about, <clears throat> it only is good if you really want to, to make things better. So I was talking to my students this morning because we were on the, it was supposed to be last week when we had the snow. And so um, it, it was today and I was telling them, I was like, I'm going to be talking to some other people about this later today. The thing is, I think that students come in and I, I see it. I see them, they look stressed out and they say they don't sleep at all. And they have five jobs and 20 classes and all this stuff and they've taken on too much. But also they have just resigned themselves to the fact that they're just gonna be unhappy. Everything stinks, everything is awful. And it's just gonna be awful until they're done with school and they get a job. And always like, you know, first of all, when you get that job, you're gonna, there's gonna be stress and there's, I mean, it's not like once college is over, everything's perfect in your life. So you've got to start to learn how to deal with stress now. And I tell them when you can manage your stress and get better sleep, manage your time, get organized with things. 
um, you can be happier. And I tell them like, right now, you could actually be happier. You can get more sleep. You can get, be more efficient with your homework. And as I suspected, I've got a cat trying to get into something. I knew, I almost said I got a cat and a dog, or two cats and a dog is going to do something. Anyway, um, they just don't realize that they could be happier and more efficient and that things can be good and they can in, enjoy their classes. That's what I really come around to. I'm like, you know, I, I enjoyed college. It was stressful. I had a lot to do, but I don't want them to just get through it. I want them to remember, you know, we all look back on college and things we did and, and I want them to, to, to be healthy and safe and also maybe enjoy some things. It doesn't have to be so awful. So, so this is not an exact science. These are just some things that I do in my classroom with my students. It's a whole semester project. So I'm going to cram it all into right now. Um, and it's not an exact science. Like I said, it's just some things that we do. And even the things that I talk about, I, I try to kind of pare it down. I have a million things about stress management, way more things to do, uh, more tips for sleep, um, time management, even I've got a whole thing. And then um, another thing that I feel very strongly about is building community, which I feel like, say this again, um, which I feel like is a way to um, manage your stress when you build that community. If you have that, the support, you've got to have your people. Who are you talking to? Who, you know, what are you hearing? What are some positive things that you're hearing? So I feel like all of that is very important, um, you know, as we go along. So I feel like us also as faculty and staff and working with students and just in our lives and everybody else that we talk to, I feel like it's important if we all adopt some of these ideas or, you know, these, these practices, things that we can do with our students, but things also in our own lives. I know I'm always working on time management, things that I can do, trying to see if I'm stressed, what's bothering me, what can I do about it, how can I cope, because I don't want to be stressed out all the time, um, I have a lot to do, I have lots of grading to do, like everybody, and um, I always have to just manage my time and try to get that done, and so just things that I do to try to, you know, get, help that along, and also just show students that, you know, we all have a lot to do, but it's manageable if you prioritize and do things like that. So I also have another little quote, it's a Mary Inglebright thing, I have a, you know, daily calendar. And it's kind of like that, a uh, little bit like my joke, it's a little bit different, but it actually was yesterday's day. And it says, take responsibility of your own happiness, never put it in the hand, in other people's hands. And that's the thing, you know, nobody's really responding. If you're waiting for someone else to make you happy, if you're waiting for other people to do it for you, it might not ever happen. So you've got to be, you know, taking care of yourself. You've got to do these things. You've got to be proactive. You've got to get a handle on these things. And no one ever talked to me about this stuff in college, ever. I don't think anybody cared if I was stressed out or sleepy or <laughs> anything when I went to college. And that's, you know, whatever. But back then, I mean, they just, they just, it was fine, but I, you know, nobody ever talked to me about managing my time or sleeping or so. Um, okay, so I've got some notes. So I'm looking around just to make sure I do all this. Uh, you know, I'll, so I'm just going to start talking about some things and I, I, I'm going to ask for a lot of your ideas when I ask questions about what you do or what you think about certain things and just throw some stuff into the chat really quickly. And hopefully Mr. Judy can just read through those. I, I, I like to just all see what everybody else is thinking. And I, this is what I do in class. And so as we go through the chats and stuff, um, what I like to do is in class, and not every day, and I have full classes, so I know with hybrids, it's more difficult, but uh, sometimes in class, I just throw out a different topic and talk to them about different things. And then we have a stress chapter. General psychology lends itself to this topic so much more easily. I mean, we had a chapter about sleep today. So we're talking about sleep. We had a long chat about that. We have a stress chapter, but... I started talking about these things at the beginning of the semester and I, I kind of keep at it. And I think I, I've heard from a lot of people that say, and, and I know, you know, MACC just cut our classes by five minutes a couple of years ago. We're already pressed for time. And then that cut five minutes in and that's, that's significant. And so saying, okay, or, you know, certain days of class to come in and spend five days, five minutes or so talking about these things seems like, gosh, we just don't have time. 
And so I've got a couple of things that about that. First of all, I kind of feel like we can't really afford not to. I feel like our students' mental health and 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 their happiness is worth spending a few minutes on and talking to them about it. Some of them really might not have a lot of people in their lives who who care. They might not have a very good support system. So also, I feel like if they are hearing it from more than one teacher, um, that's good. If we're all checking in and saying, hey, how are things going? What are you doing? Um, some other ways to do this, I, what often happens in my classes, and it's, it's okay because we're very much discussion-based and we talk about these topics anyway, but if it starts to become a long conversation, <clears throat> one thing that you could do is just say, okay, well, we need to get on with our class, but uh, I'm going to put it into a discussion thread and let's continue this discussion. And you know, what are some ways that you manage your stress and some good time management tips and all the different chats that we're going to do today, uh, the different little um, questionnaires I'm going to give you. All of those kinds of things just to ask your students, uh, you know, icebreakers, ways to relieve the stress. There are also good transitions, like I mentioned. Um, and don't forget your online students. I, I try to, so every week we usually have a, a content discussion and then for lack of a better term, I just call them chatty discussions, um, where they just talk about stuff. Like this week's, or this past week's topic was, what's your favorite comedy? Which we're gonna talk about, which, this is very important. Um, and they all just talk to each other and building that community, but also I feel like watching comedy is a good stress reliever. Um, but you can, you can still get your online students involved and you can still talk about these things. You can provide them with articles, um, show them how important this stuff is, just check in with them. One thing that I like to do, well, I mean, that I that ends up needing to be done is when we do have these discussions at the beginning of class, I kind of try to notice if there's a student who seems like they've got something particularly going on. You never know. I mean, I've had students who, you know, halfway through the semester, I found out that their child has leukemia and they have been going to St. Louis every other day for treatments. Oh my gosh. Um, so I kind of jot down, you know, names of a couple of students who seem like they're struggling and, and just maybe send them a note. I hope you're doing okay. Let me know if there's anything I can do, even if they don't write back, because you know they don't always write back. Um, showing that we care, just showing that we're all out here and we're we're all stressed out too. We all, you know, from different times. Um, there's just sometimes are busier than others. We're all going through things, and we all have to try to keep that under control. So I think that if we can adapt some good habits and try to help the students, you know, and it's a process. It's not like you're going to wake up tomorrow and never have stress again, never be unorganized, but just trying to, to keep on track of those things. Um, so let's see, I'm going to go ahead and share the beginning of my um, hold on. It's not coming up with my PowerPoint for some reason, and I've got it. To, I'm seeing a bunch of stuff I don't reckon. Oh, God, there it is. I was gonna, I'm not a techie. If you guys know me, I'm a trekkie, not a techie. So, okay. Um, so what causes stress? We know that you know, we we know these things, there's different things that can happen, all kinds of stuff, traumatic events, lifestyle conditions, major life changes, even the minor hassles. So Here's what I want to do is just to start out that first chat and ask you what causes stress for you? Just quick 30 seconds, just you know, something that what is the stressful thing that that you experience? Busy schedules, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of stuff. I think I, there's a lot. I know Mr. Judy was going to try to read through these. Uh, might be might be too many to read through, which is good. I love this. This is good. We're seeing a lot of things. Oh gosh, I have a 15 year old daughter. <laughs> yeah, the fantastic amount of responses here, and a lot of it comes down to either unexpected changes or obstacles. Um, super busy schedules. I kind of went along with that and let uh, mine was letting the to-do list get a little bit too long. So, um, and, and yeah, we have some others that are, you know, incredibly, uh, incredibly serious, like 
chronic illness is in here. Lots of stuff about our kids. Um, so I think that there's definitely a pattern here of um, managing kids and family, managing um, a busy work-life balance, um, and then, of course, unexpected change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing we talk about um, just in the theories of psychology and what determines our behavior. One big thing is uh, your expectations. And so I talk a lot about what happens when you wake up, and you're ready for school and everything's good and there's 10 inches of snow on the ground and you're stuck and your car's stuck and you can't get anywhere else. You know, you know, school's canceled, all of that stuff. And we talk about, you know, how to be flexible, how to perceive that as not the end of the world, not the worst thing that can happen. What can I do differently? And we talk a lot about you know, those, those in the immediate stress reduction things like the count to 10 and the deep breathing, which I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. I got to, I feel like I'm going to repeat myself, but um, I do this with my, my students. I have them meditate, but it's like, those things are cliche because they're true and they're good. And you really should, you know, how many times have you reacted to something right away? And then it ended up being not that bad. We all have. And, you know, if you could just stop in that moment, if you can remember to just stop for a second and say, okay, how big is this? Um, other things uh, that I saw, you know, sometimes it's just a, a, also a matter of, you know, getting that support, getting help when it's needed. Sometimes that's not always possible. And so some of those things, it's just an ongoing situation and that's just tough. Um, and then I saw one about situations that you can't change. We talk about that also. We have those, definitely. I always say, especially the weather and traffic, you know, you can't do anything about those. And I know that I can't change anybody else's behavior, but sometimes, and I'm not trying to sound flip or, or like it's nothing or anything, but I mean, sometimes we truly do just have to change our perception of things. If, you, if there's something that you are just going to have to deal with, you have to just find a way to, to, to handle that or to try to avoid that if you can, or if there's something else, or talk to other people. Sometimes just having a good sounding board, having someone to talk to about those things. Um, okay, so I also just super quick, I have a document um, here, let me scoot this over. And I can share this uh, with anyone who, who wants it. I can make it available somehow. It's the 25 surprising ways stress affects your health. So uh, you know, I'm just gonna scroll down. You can just take a look. It, it damages your heart, it causes insomnia, headaches. It causes memory problems. You can't remember stuff. People think that staying up all night studying is the key. No, it's not. You can't remember anything. Um, damages your hair, it hurts pregnancy, blood sugar messes up, digestion, blood pressure, brain tissue. I mean, it starts to damage your body in so many ways. I'm just gonna just kind of scroll on down here. Um, again, I'm not gonna read through this whole thing and I already, it's already 2.22. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to show you, you know, students don't, um, yes. And I, I'm gonna make the slides available and then I have a couple of websites and then that article just, that's the thing. It's like people realize, don't realize that being stressed out really does harm you. And in our stress chapter in Psych 101, we have a little picture of a man and all the things that are happening, but the two big things that are happening when you're constantly stressed, well, when you have that stress response is your heart beats faster and the strength of the contractions increases. And also your, your body releases more sugar into the bloodstream and less insulin. Both of those are recipes for heart disease and diabetes. And that's why those are huge in our country. We have a huge problem with both of those things because we don't ever have a release from that stress. We don't ever stop and people don't think that they need to stop. They think it's just okay to be stressed and this is just the way you live and this is the way you go and they don't value relaxing. We also kind of have a culture in, in our, our country that, you know, if you're relaxing and you're a slacker and you're lazy and you're not doing anything when really the truth is that that's healthier and you're going to be more efficient if you have some relaxing time. So we really have a wrong way of thinking about these things in our country. Um, we also have a quick thing in our chapter about the social readjustment rating scale. It's this big list of things 
little tiny things that could happen to you that I show to the students and just to raise awareness of all the little things because sometimes we, we don't even give credit to something that's bothering us, things that we could try to change. When you notice that something is bothering you, that's it's great that you can try to change it or avoid it or, or something or deal with it, but we let that stuff fester and we say to ourselves, I shouldn't let that bother me. Why not? We, we, we put so many restrictions on ourselves. I shouldn't feel sad. I shouldn't feel mad. Those emotions cause us to take action. That's you feel that because maybe there's something that needs to happen. Maybe you need to do something and, and take care of that. But we suppress it and then it festers and it becomes this whole ball of stress. And it's um, I see it and I hear it a lot. And uh, it's a shame. And I know I, I get stressed out too, but I definitely find times to just relax and just have a release from that because I just I just I know it's it's damaging me. Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to put into the chat. Okay, I'm not going to share anything. Uh, here's what I want to hear from you. How how do you handle your stress? What do you do? Do you, what are your tips? Do you take a walk, call a friend, listen to music. I'm just going to read through them as they come in. <clears throat> uh, outside, yeah. Oh, outside. Oh my gosh. Retail therapy. <laughs> oh yeah. We need to hug each other. And in the pandemic, we can't hug as much. Um, I, I miss hugging people. <laughs> We're all like six feet away. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Walking, you know, any kind of I say taking a walk with a friend is the best thing because you're walking and talking and you get those endorphins and all of that stuff. Yes, the deep breaths. Um so I do this with my my students, and this is a little bit uh, actually another slide, but um, okay, just keeping track of my stuff. Um, and so yeah, I mean, there's lots and lots of things that we can do, but I like uh, when the students all talk about all these things because they give each other ideas, and um, you know, just talk about you know how do you handle stress, and it's it's you know even some sometimes students say that they cry, and it's like you know. Yeah, sometimes you just feel like crying and it's okay. You have to release that. And we hold too much in and you just need to feel your feelings. And, uh, you know, there's you know, no problem in, in doing that. Um, let me go on and share a couple more slides here. So, um, oops. Okay, so here are just some tips. Gosh, I've got a, a million things. I, again, try to pare it down. And I know there's too much on a slide, but connecting with family, friends, neighbors, um, being outside, I think being outside is like the, the number one thing because you got to get that sunshine and fresh air. Maybe if you're walking around a little bit, you're, you're doing something. But um, with, with, you know, our internet and the way things are and escaping and FaceTiming and stuff, you can play an online game together, have a meal together with other people. Um, now, here's the thing, too. Um, I wanted to ask you all, uh, being from other community colleges around Missouri, um, seeing a therapist. I mean, sometimes these are things, it's, it's, it's too much more than just these things that we've mentioned. You need to seek professional help, see a therapist or a counselor, help your students find these resources. I know that at uh, MACC, we have a student assistance program, and we also, we're very lucky, we have a special agreement with a Central Methodist University where we have their clinical counseling services um, and we students, it's free. Uh, both of those are free to our students and they can uh, access that and it's Zoom now. It used to just be on the Columbia campus. And so showing students how they can access that, reminding them, put that information out there so they can see it. Um, I think that's very important. And I always tell them, this might be the last time you ever have free counseling, you should go. <laughs> but um, I, this is the big thing. A lot of students say, I don't need to see anybody, it's not that bad yet. And that that's where I say, that's exactly when you need to go see somebody. If it's, if it's, if it's a bigger problem, sure, of course you need to go, but they feel like it's gotta be a monumental DSM problem before you go and get some help. And I'm like, you go and talk to somebody before it gets worse, before you, you can't even go to work or school and it's debilitating and go and talk to somebody now about anything, anything at all. So what I wanna ask you all now as a, a colleagues from other community colleges, do you all have counseling services available to your students at your 
schools. I'm just wondering if you do have that kind of thing. Okay. Jefferson College. Okay. 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 So St. Louis Community College. Okay. Brief, more short term. Okay. Crowder. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Another partnership with CMU. It is difficult to get students to utilize, but part of, oh, OTC, uh, part of my thing is, again, we need to advertise it more. If we're all talking about it, normalizing these things, I think, is a, a key. Um, and uh, creating a counselor center at North Central Missouri College. Okay, uh, yeah, I think, uh, <clears throat> I don't think there was counseling available when I was in college. If there was, I did not know about it. So, <clears throat> Again, just kind of normalizing those things and, and talking about that and saying, you know, I've had a few students who have gone to to get help, but um, it, surely, you know, I always feel like everybody could go and talk to somebody once or twice, you know, but I even tell them if you're having trouble in algebra, go talk to somebody, you know, <clears throat> and and there's gold in, in these autumn, I can't tell all my troubles to strangers. Like there's golden strangers. They are going to keep it quiet. They're not going to put it on Facebook. Nobody's going to even know you were there and they're going to listen and you could do all the talking and it's perfect. So um, anyway, just that's just another thing is just making sure that the kids know about that. Students, I say kids, I'm sorry. Students know about that. So just some other tips to manage stress. Um, and a couple of other things I'm going to do. So I'm going to do another chat here in just a second. I'll just kind of read through some of these things. Some some people mentioned a lot of these things. I'm really big on the comedy thing. I mean, I don't watch a ton of TV, but I also, part of my thing is I talk about, like I was talking today about how we have a culture where we need to zero in on something and we don't let up until it's over, until it's, the problem's solved or the task is done. I, that causes stress. And sometimes when you're zeroed in so much on something, you can't see it. And how many times have you walked away from something and then you came back and you're like, oh, there it is. You can finish that paper. You can solve the problem. Um, we don't value taking a break. And uh, these days with Netflix and Hulu and all that stuff, it's kind of perfect because episodes, you know, little short things are, are just like 20 minutes. That's a perfect break. Take a break, watch some comedy and get a snack and then come back to whatever you're doing. Um, so I like to ask the students, and this is a great conversation starter, and any of these things can be, you know, also like the stress tips and stuff, um, discussion questions that you can do in your in your classes, just to get them talking to each other, to see that they're all on the same boat and, and get all that stuff. But um, so I just wanna ask you guys, what's your favorite comedies? Mine, I like New Girl, I'm watching Frasier right now, which is cracking me up because He's like, oh, just psychiatrist. Um, oh, that one's a good one. Uh, yeah, um, Parks and Rec. I love that one. The Good Place is fun. This is just funny to see what everybody. Yeah, and movies too. Yeah, just and stand up. You know, um, it's just fun to see the students what what they all like together, what they have in common. We hear about new shows, things I've never, I've watched a lot of stuff that I had never would have heard of, except my students told me about it. The office, I used to work in an office. Years ago, I worked in a library in an office for f several years. <laughs> and so that, the office is great. <laughs> um, Ghostbusters, always fun. Oh my gosh, New Girl, Center into Labor. New Girl is just about the funniest thing. And How I Met Your Mother. <laughs> what? Funny. Okay. So it's just, you know, just get some ideas. Uh, it's okay to watch comedy. Here's another thing, just jumping out a little bit more to the sleep thing. But I found that if you watch comedy right before you go to bed, it sounds like it wouldn't work. Laughing really hard and then going right to sleep, it works. I've had students that came back and said, oh my gosh, I watched an episode of The Office and I went right to sleep. Um, you know, so moving into the, the the tips about sleep, you know, how to get more sleep and stuff. But uh, watching comedy right before <laughs> going to bed is actually great. You, you shift your mind off your problems, laugh, and then go right to sleep. Um, so one of the things for managing stress is getting good sleep. Um, and I have some tips here. And, you know, I want to make sure and say when there's the issue of insomnia, caused by other kinds of issues, uh, medical issues or something like that, that is a, is a separate kind of thing that 
that can be managed with a lot of different things, medications. Sometimes there can be some things with that, but um, when it's just, you know, when you're just trying to get to sleep better, or you're just trying to get to sleep and make a good schedule. Um, I, I always, like I was telling my students this morning, uh, you need to find what, where your key is, like what's your optimum amount of sleep. Mine used to be eight. I'm slipping into the seven to seven and a half hour thing now. I keep waking up like an hour before my alarm. I think it's because I'm getting older because <laughs> um, you need a little less as you get older. I have an assignment in my online general psychology class where they read an article about the dangers of sleep, sleep deprivation and ask them, you know, what should we do about it? Why is this? Why do we stay up all night? What, what can we do differently? And usually they come around to the, the ideas that, you know, setting a good schedule is one of the keys. And that really is it. Now it's tough for kids because students, because they have different work schedules. One just told me this morning, sometimes she works till three in the morning at a pizza place. I'm like, well, that's hard to have a regular sleep schedule. The, the key really is trying to get more sleep. Um, so putting the screens down, students say, well, I look at the, I look at my phone because I'm awake. Well, you're awake because that blue light generates, you know, stimulates your brain. It makes you awake. That's why you're awake. You've got to put it down. Uh, another thing is you really need to put your phone about six feet away from your head when you go to sleep because when it lights up with alerts or, uh, you know, there's some kind of, I'm not sure what it's called, but some kind of rays or something that kind of emits from the phone and that messes with your sleep schedule. If you're like in a deep sleep, that will actually interrupt your deep sleep and then you don't feel rested. We don't, we're not really always aware of that. So, there's that. Um, don't exercise, drink caffeine or alcohol right before bed. People think, oh, I drink a beer and that relaxes me, but that actually messes with your dreaming. Alcohol right before bed is actually not a good idea. Uh, weighted blankets are helpful, especially in the winter. Yoga, meditation, managing the stress. A lot of times, you know, not being able to sleep properly is due to, so they see these they all kind of go in together. So um, the meditating thing, someone mentioned that they meditate, or I think a few people did. I do this in class with my students, um, especially this, just the breathing. I'm like, when we're stressed out, it took me a really long time to figure out that when I'm stressed out, I'm actually holding my breath just a little bit. I'm just like not breathing. And people would always tell me to breathe and I'd get mad because I'm like, I'm breathing. I'm clearly, but, but I really wasn't. I would like hold my breath and then I get a headache and I get nauseous and dizzy and we're not breathing. And so I, you know, we practice in class, you know, breathing in through our nose, now through our mouth and vision, smelling a rose and then blowing out a candle. And like, you can do this all day long. You just, while you're driving, you, you should do this. And especially when you're going into a test, we don't just breathe. We really don't. Some people really don't do that. Um, okay. Um, so uh, just a quick show of hands. Does anybody here meditate? I know I saw that a couple of times, but just to throw that out, just a quick yes. If other people meditate, there's a lot of great apps that my students have a lot of things on there. Oh, yoga is good too. Yeah, yoga and meditating are very much all both very good. Um, there's apps that the students have that, you know, then, then we're sharing information. What do you do? And it'll kind of time it for you to walk you through a meditation. And meditating doesn't have to take very long. A true meditative state, they say, could be achieved in seven minutes. Um, you can have a timer on your phone with the app that'll, you know, tell you it's been 10 or 15 minutes. And um, I think it's it's those kinds of things. Uh, oh, resources. Yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of things. Yes. We just really need to have something to remind us to relax. Um, okay, so the next thing I wanted to ask you, yeah, here we go, okay. Tell me what's your alarm clock? Is it, well, is it something really annoying or is it something happy and friendly? Oh, soft music, happy, friendly, good. Oh, good, I'm seeing a lot of good, happy things. I saw one annoying. <laughs> okay, okay, oh, kids. I know somebody else has like kids laughing is their alarm clock. Oh gosh. Okay, good. Well, I just had my my alarm clock talk with my two uh, gen psych classes this morning, and it's always the same kind of thing. They don't quite believe me. I always set my alarm clock to go off. My alarm clock is church bells because it reminds me of a vacation I took, and it always 
makes me happy when I hear it. It always, I wake up happy and I don't think people even give it a thought, but when your alarm clock is annoying, and, and I talked to my students about this, and this is another thing you can just talk to your students about real quickly, is just maybe try to think about changing your alarm clock because when your alarm clock sound is annoying, you wake up kind of angry or, or annoyed, you know? I mean, you kind of wake up hearing this yucky noise. Now I know the wisdom, I have heard, heard this for 12 years that if it's not annoying, you won't wake up. That's not true. Um, the main thing is if you've had enough sleep, you'll wake up to any noise. But, uh, you know, if you, you know, get yourself ready to, oh, some people don't need alarm clocks at all. I wish I didn't. I wish I could just wake up. Um, if you have something that's happy and friendly, um, you're just going to wake up happier and friendlier. I just feel very strongly about a, a good alarm clock sound. Um, so, you know, like a, a, a nice song that you like, and then they say, well, we'll get tired of that song. And so change it up every once in a while. And so like right now I have two classes that I've charged them with trying this out and try it on the weekend when you don't have to get up at you know, five o'clock in the morning and be somewhere, maybe on the weekend or something. But if you've had enough sleep, you put your phone away and turn it up and then you'll have to get up to turn it off, but just wake up to something happier. I feel very strongly about that. That's when you're already gonna start out a little happier. <laughs> so, okay, so there's that. Um, Okay, so then also I was going to ask you guys, um, Grace, oh, oh, <laughs> I must have missed that one. Um, okay, so I was going to also ask you to put into the chat, what are your tips for, for better sleep? What there's Because there's lots of different things that people do. So do you have some kind of a routine or something specific or like a, a white noise machine or something? Good sleep hygiene, yeah. Yeah, the fan, yeah, that's a good one. <clears throat> fan, fan humidifier, yeah. Those you know, those the sounds that just kind of, yeah, the routine is good. Oh, that's the story. Sometimes I can just lull you into sleep. Reading a book, yes, reading your cat, yeah. You know, there's lots of things that, and everybody's kind of different. So sometimes those tips are good, but, um, you know, we just, you know, everybody's kind of got to do their own things essential oils. If you can, at the same time every night and waking up, yeah, just, I go to sleep every night around 10 and I wake up, well, around six, starting to turn into 5.30 these days. Um, yeah, keep the room cold and dark, a little noise, that's, that's very good. Um, so I've got a couple of tabs to show you real quickly. Um, and I'm, let me kind of uh, get my, other tabs kind of out of the way here to show you. Um, okay, hopefully this will work out. Okay. And then hopefully that's showing you the, just, just a couple of quick tabs and I can share these, these websites, but again, just, you know, we've seen the effects of stress on our body, these effects of sleep deprivation, you know, the memory issues, mood changes. Oh, sorry about the side things there. Trouble thinking, concentrating, accidents, more accidents happen, weight gain, high blood pressure, risk of heart disease. Um, and, and, and there's all kinds of things. I'm not gonna spend too much time going all through that. I can share that, but, uh, oh, it was on my email instead of the website. Okay, well, I can share those links. There's another one. Uh, they're, they're both just the effects of sleep deprivation. Um, it's just important to know that it's just not good for you. And we've got this culture of staying up all night. And, and I even asked the students, you know, what do you hear if you tell someone that you got a full night of sleep? And they say, well, then you're a slacker or you didn't get anything done. And I know that I used to grade papers late at night and it took me three times as long to do it at night when I was tired. And now I get plenty of sleep and I get up and I'm so much more effective. They feel like, you know, the, the whole wisdom is you gotta stay up all night and get everything done. And I know some, I've got a child, sometimes you are up, sometimes you are going to have a sleepy night, but if most of the time, if you can get better sleep, then you can manage stress better. You can have a better attitude. You can be more efficient. You can get things done better. I know that that happened for me. I mean, I used to not get very good sleep, but I used to not 
be very organized and I was stressed out and I didn't really give that much thought, especially in my 20s, you know, my teens and 20s. And I started noticing, oh my gosh, I could, I, you know, I had friends that got plenty of sleep and they were happy and organized. And I was like, how do you do that? And, and it just these things. Pull the cat. Okay. So let me just see. Uh, kind of going to have to go a little faster here, but uh, where's my, let's go. Okay. So <clears throat> managing our time, there's lots of different type, uh, ways to, manage our time, lots of different things that we can do. I have a whole big thing about the to-do list. I feel very strongly about the to-do list. Um, I talk to my students about this a lot. So we, we, we do it to ourselves. We set ourselves up for failure with the to-do list. We put too much on it. Even when I'm making a list still, sometimes I put something on there that I'm like, that's not reasonable. And they come back. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that on Saturday. So just take it off. But also, you know, things like we just we just do it to ourselves, and then we feel like we failed because we didn't get everything marked off that list. So I tell my students that you know, organize your list as today. What has what needs to get done today? What can be done tomorrow? What's just this week by Friday? What's over the weekend? And break up bigger tasks into smaller tasks. I really talk to them a lot about, you know, each assignment, when I show them an assignment, I show them how to break it up. Like do this the first couple of days, do this a little bit when you find little bits of time. And that's kind of one of our time management things, but, you know, look for little nuggets of time um, to try to do something. And, and I'm also, you know, don't, you don't have to be working and being productive all the time, schedule in your fun time, Make sure you're relaxing and doing those things, but try to get your work done during the day when you're more efficient, when you're more alert, and then at night, you can just watch a comedy and go to bed. And it's not always that easy, but, and that's the thing, it's like, it's a process. It takes a long time to incorporate some tips and try to, to make them, you know, part of your routine. But I feel like it's, it's worth a try. I mean, we have to try to, you know, find some ways to make things easier for ourselves because it's easy to just let it be bad. Um, <clears throat> so again, on the, the to-do list, like for their research paper, I'm like, don't put on your, your list Saturday, write the research paper. Like, don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Put a, uh, pick a topic for the research paper on Saturday. Okay. Um, you know, next week, Google that topic, look at the book and see what the book says about it. <clears throat> Uh, maybe find a website website that has information about it, um, you know, and then the next week, maybe find another article, break it up into smaller pieces. I kind of go week to week and say, maybe this week you could work on citations. Ask me questions. If you don't understand, that's part of where procrastination comes from is that they don't understand what they have to do. And so they just push it off. They don't even want to think about it. So make, you know, and, and as, as faculty and staff, we can do whatever we can for students to make sure that they have all the information that they need for things. What, what do they maybe not know? What's the process about, you know, enrolling or something or like an assignment? Is it, is it clear or all these, all the instructions clear? Um, making sure that everything's there that they need and then asking, you know, hey, cause I know I always tell them like, I'm quite aware that I'm not always clear. That is something, there's still something that somebody might have a question on. And so, you know, invite those questions. Um, make sure that they're understanding that stuff. So just more on time management, um, you know, plan your week on Sunday if possible. Just look at the whole week and see what's coming up, being aware of those things. Um, schedule breaks, you know, schedule fun stuff. Don't, you know, you're not saying don't ever have fun. We're just saying, make sure you get your work done. Um, my big thing, I kind of <laughs> came up with this little cash phrase, but I noticed that the students would say, I can't turn in my research paper on the 8th because I have two other things due that day. And I was like, the due date doesn't have to be the, the day you do it. it in fact, it, it probably shouldn't be the day you do it. it sh you should be working your head. And then if you see that you have three things due that day, they kind of feel like some of them have the attitude that I have three things due that day. Only one of them is going to get done. It's like, oh my gosh, but you, I mean, you've had like two weeks to know about this and to, to work on it. And so 
what I tell them, you know, I talk to them a lot about getting a calendar, something there. And I, on the next slide, I've got information about online scheduling and things that they can do, whatever works. I'm a paper girl, but um, <clears throat> write the day that something's due and then put in the day you're going to do it. Like, okay, because, you know, it's due Friday, but you've got tomorrow off. Why don't you do it tomorrow? Um, that kind of thing, because they, some of them just really have that mindset. Uh, you know, I wait until that day it's due and then I got to do it. Well, what if uh, you get sick? What if your Wi-Fi is out? What if you got to go to work? You know, and so then you, you got to get it done. Um, and so you just have to get, just to get their frame of mind changed just a little bit. Okay, so just to get through a few more things. <clears throat> I'm all about looking at the small bits of time when we can do something. I have lots of grading to do at any given time. And I used to kind of be of the mind where I don't have, I can't grade until I have like four hours. It's gonna take me four hours to do all this. I'll wait until I have four hours to do it all. Well, I never have four hours in a row all at once to do it. So I started looking for, I got 20 minutes. I'm gonna sit down and grade a few things. So I tell them, you know, if you're sitting somewhere, you got 20 minutes, you know, Google your research paper topic you know, do something. Um, so trying to keep track of it all, keeping uh, organized. I've also got a, a whole other set of tips and things, but I think part of it is just organizing the rest of your life, you know, making sure everything in your house is organized, um, getting rid of the clutter. I did, I did see uh, a thing that caused someone stress was the clutter, you know, organizing your house. Sometimes I can't grade papers until I clean my house. I need to do the dishes and turn on some laundry and then I can sit down and grade papers because that's bothering me. Another big thing that I think that stresses us out that we need to manage, not necessarily our time, but is like money. Money's a big stressor. I think students don't realize where they're spending all their money, where is it all going, and their money is not, maybe not, um, you know, steady. They don't make the same amount every week, and so, but I, it's a big stressor, and so just making them aware of, you know, you be aware of where your money's going, how much you need to be saving, what do you need to be doing. Um, so here's where we got some apps for time management, um, you know, when I, whatever works for you, even just a notebook. Sometimes it's nice to see the whole week. Sometimes it's nice to see the whole month. Um, you know, put in all due dates and tasks. You know, whatever you do, make sure it's it's that you are consistent about it. Um, okay, so I already I just have this one thing <laughs> on this slide on purpose. Don't multitask. You know, we used to pride ourselves in being able to multitask and do two things at once. When you do that, though. I mean, unless you're like stirring soup and talking on the phone, that's fine, multitasking. But if you're trying to do two tasks, two different things on homework or something, neither chances are neither one of them will be very good. Chances are you're just not concentrating. Just do one thing at a time and then do the next thing and get it done and take breaks and, and you know, go between them if you need to. Do one, take a break, do the other, go back to the first. But Trying to do two things at once just isn't the best way to get things done. Um, another way for stress building or stress management, sorry, I'm trying to talk to you this, is community building. And this is another thing that's very near and dear to my heart. And last year when we were on Zoom all the time, I felt very strong about building community and things that we could do. And now we're kind of back in the classroom, but I still feel like I'm trying to still keep that community piece. And so, you know, having conversations in the beginning of the class is a good thing. And you can even start it before class technically starts. Just start asking them certain questions about things and start having that conversation. And even like, you know, asking their favorite comedy. And as they're all coming in, just write them on the board, you know, kind of keep a running list so that the people who are coming in late can see what we've been talking about and didn't miss what we did. Um, and just kind of keep that, keep that there and and then they're all talking to each other and again seeing those commonalities because it's easy to feel alone in a room full of classmates and I know I, I know a lot of students that you know don't feel like they connect with the school or anybody else or me or you know so we're just trying to build those connections and seeing what we can do so I call them my chatty discussions um it's having opportunities in the class to talk in pairs or groups of the whole class invite them to come to our office hours. We've really had a big uh, push for office hours and trying to make them more inviting, make students aware of them here at MACC to try to 
really come to office hours, they are for you. They are for you to come and talk to me if you've got questions, if you need something, there's something I can help you with. Um, one thing I've been doing is um, with my online students, because I, you know, I never see them. And so I started doing this thing the first week or two of classes is I would invite them to just come to a Zoom. And sometimes I'd have to do like a day one and a night one just like a 10 or 15 minute meeting where they come in and we take a class walk where we kind of I show them around. Here's where everything is. I record it. I put it up for people who couldn't come. But I feel like if they can see me and hopefully they would feel like I'm more accessible if they can see me for a minute and talk to me and then they feel more comfortable emailing me if they have questions. Um, encourage students to study with other students. That's another way for them to feel connected. Oops. Um, so just the basics, eat right, sleep right, exercise, manage your stress, try to have fun and enjoy the classes. And here's just some other things that we get to in our in my general psych class, um, just some things throughout the semester that we talk about, uh, but that positive self-talk. I really feel like, so in our memory chapter, we talk about how fairly easy it is to brainwash someone. We talk about cults and how people believe what they're hearing all the time. You believe what you're hearing all the time. So what are you saying to yourself? Are you saying, oh, this class is going to be terrible. I'm going to get a terrible grade. I'm going to flunk this class. Are you saying that all the time? Because if you're saying that to yourself all the time, you're going to believe it. And so you've got to be aware of what you're saying to yourself. What are you saying out loud? And you've got to make it more positive. You got to say, I got to get some help with this. I got to talk to my teacher. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get it done early. I'm going to find out what's involved and what's necessary and what's needed, and I'm going to get it all done, and it's going to be great. But you, you know, it's easy to fall into that negative self-talk thing, but you've got to really think about what's, what are you saying? And I always feel like, I have a little thing that I, I feel like is, is true. If you think good things, you're going to say good things, and you're going to do good things. You've got to stay on that positive track. Sometimes it's hard. <laughs> no. Um, availability bias is something we talk about with our thinking and intelligence chapter. We estimate probabilities based on the available availability of vivid mental images of the event. So we talk about when you're watching crime shows and scary movies and all of that stuff on TV, I talk to them a lot about, and news. I talk to them a lot about, don't watch the news so much. And they say, well, it doesn't scare me. It doesn't bother me. It creeps in. It creeps into your subconscious, it gets in there and it causes a low level of stress that you're not even aware of. That doesn't even have anything to do with you, but you're seeing all these horrible things and there are horrible things in the world. And it's not that we don't care, but it's that we have to take care of our things. And so, especially towards the end of the semester, I'm like, stop watching your TV, watch your comedy. Go to the comedy, watch the funny stuff. That's fine. <laughs> stop watching CSI and Forensics Files. Um, and then the last thing is mood can grow up memory. It's a memory process that selectively retrieves memories that match your mood. So when you're in a bad mood or a sad mood, your brain automatically, and it's, it feels like we're just wallowing or, you know, doing all that stuff and just always on the, on the negative, but our brain automatically goes in that direction. So you probably have had a time where something bad happened, something made you angry. And then 10 minutes later, you are thinking about everything else that's ever made you angry in your whole life. Mm -hmm. I know. And so your brain just does that. It does it automatically. And so I talk to my students a lot about how you've got to train yourself to recognize it's happening. When something bad happens, you've got to say this is an isolated event. I am just, this is this what happened. I'm going to take care of this and go on. And then and, and, and when those other things start creeping in, you have to literally say, nope, 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 not going to think about that. And it's a process and I, I have a lot of friends actually who work on this and this is you know part of their thing and they have lots of tips to try to keep from slipping into that hole but your brain literally goes that way. Now we don't worry about when something happy happens to you and you go on to the happy, all the happy memories because that's great, that's great. We're not worried about that but it's the angry and the sad. We just, something bothers you then now everything's bothering you. Everything that happens since third grade is bothering you and that's a problem and so You've got to be aware of how all that stuff is bringing you down and you've got to find a way to deal with that and not let it ruin your whole day just because something happened and 
just find a way to get good support and manage that stress. So I've got one final, I think I'm gonna actually end on time. I've got one final little um, saying my, for my Mary Englebright calendar and it's uh, today's, today's uh, date. And it says, walk towards the sunshine and the shadows will fall behind you. So you've got to make it happen. You've got to try to be happier. You've got to try to be more efficient and effective and get more sleep. And it's a process and it takes a lot of work, um, but it can happen and it can happen for all of us. And our students can be happier and feel more supported and feel happier. And we can all enjoy this if we try. So I think that's it. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you so much, Professor Allen. And thank you so much to everybody who joined us. I'm going to preview next week's, uh, next month's My Favorite Lecture, but this was our first ever time doing this. Thank you so much to Professor Allen. Um, I think there was so much in here that I think uh, just instinctively we know, but we need to hear it. We need to be reminded of it. And I know that just seeing a lot of the other folks on here who were doing and trying a lot of the things that I've been thinking about doing and trying gives me more motivation to do it. So um, yes, thank you so much, Professor Allen. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, thank you to everybody who joined us. Your time is valuable. I hope we provided some value. If you enjoyed this, stick with us in future months. We are going to be doing a My Favorite Lecture every uh, every month, the second Tuesday of the month at two o'clock in the afternoon. That was the feedback that I received as far as, you know, the cl classes are typically in the morning, then you get into the lunch hour. And then if you get away from that, hopefully we'll draw as many people as possible. Um, the second Tuesday of the month, um, I'll probably only switch that up if we're like in a finals month, like May or December, move that up to the first Tuesday of the month. Regardless, if you're an MCCA member, you're going to be getting notifications about all of this. Um, so a quick preview of what we've got coming up next month. Um, I cheated. I just have to admit to all of you, I went ahead and I cheated. So one of the OTC uh, award winners at the convention this last fall was Charlotte Choate. Very deserving uh, award winner. I messaged her. I asked, hey, would you be interested in doing this My Favorite Lecture project that we're trying to launch? Well, she is a nursing instructor. And she said, uh, my favorite lectures uh, include bodily functions and infectious diseases. And I just really don't think you're going to have very many people who are going to sign up to see that lecture. So she sent me along to somebody else who is super excited to talk to us next month. Oh, started from the beginning. We're going to have Dr. Susan Inman from OTC. And she's going to be talking about autism and higher education, breaking down barriers. Um, so that's going to be on Tuesday, March the 8th at two o'clock in the afternoon. I hope you set your calendars. And like I said, we'll be sending out um, reminders to everybody here, you know, a week out or maybe two weeks out. Um, so this one uh, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, my mom was a speech therapist for a public school district here in Missouri for years and years and years. And then she transitioned over to being an autism consultant for the state. So she, uh, for about uh, probably 15 years now, has been, um, she drives around to different public school districts around the state and just makes sure that they're up to date with their autism um, protocols and their and their curriculum and, and everything like that. Make sure that they have, um, they're set up for success for their students who are diagnosed with autism. So as that has been the focus for the last 15 or 20 or even 30 years in the elementary and the secondary education environments, more and more of those students are succeeding, more and more of those students are getting into higher education. So Dr. Inman is going to be talking to us about the neuroscience behind someone who is diagnosed with autism, the neuroscience behind how their brain is processing the information that you are uh, giving to them in the classroom, how you can set them up for success. So I hope you will join us next month. Again, that's gonna be Tuesday, March the 8th at 2 p.m. with Dr. Susan Enman. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much to everybody for, for joining us. At our peak, we had 97 people who were here and, and, and joining us and participating and the interaction was just tremendous. So if you enjoyed this, please come back. 
please tell your colleagues about this, especially if you found, found some value in this. And um, yeah, I hope everybody has a tremendous rest of their Tuesday. And thank you very much again to Professor Allen. Thank you. Thank you, it was fun. <clears throat> All right, thanks everybody. Bye.